this is not a talk on COVID for the most part. Um, it's actually just a primer on some things that I think you guys um, would benefit from maybe a refresher on should you end up in the ICU um, in, in our shoes with our support when, you know, the idea is not to throw you all into um, ICU six, five, four, and two without any of us in-house or available. Um, but in the event that, you know, you guys are there and we're sort of just overseeing things, um, I'm sure a little bit of a refresher on critical care would be helpful for all of us. So we're gonna talk about all of these things here, probably maybe not in this order. Um, so I'll just start with the first case that we had in the ICU here with a 59 year old gentleman, history of hypertension who uh, presented on the 12th with your typical diarrhea, fever, fatigue and cough. He denied any sick contact, but he did have several coworkers who had been traveling overseas. Um, initially came in with a white count, white count of seven, lymphopenic, um, admitted to the medicine service there on nasal cannula O2. Um, and then his chest CT um, had the, you know, very typical um, patchy ground glass peripheral opacities that we have now come to know very well. Have people seen the, the 3D or 360 degree reconstruction that Dr. Mortman did? He's doing this research study and he usually uses this for operative planning and for showing his patients sort of where their tumor is. You can look for him on Facebook or Google it. It's really cool. It shows that it's a 3D reconstruction that takes you all over the lungs and the yellow parts are where the diseased lungs are. It takes you like with a view as if you're doing a bronchoscopy. It's really cool. So he did this um, for the purpose of getting it out into the media to show people stay at home. This is what happens to your lungs when, um, and that was obviously fairly early on in his course. So hospital day two, he ended up on high, high flow nasal cannula and then on BiPAP, um, his COVID test came back positive. Hospital day three, he had abrupt respiratory failure uh, that worsened requiring intubation and went into a rapid deterioration and was very hypoxic. He had an echo that showed no, normal cardiac function, um, a little bit hyperdynamic even. They started him on Plaquenil and Zithro over there. Uh, Plaquenil is just a lot easier to say quickly than the other word. Um, and then they basically said, we need more help. They paralyzed him and sent him over to GW for a higher level of care. So when, we, when he gets here, he's on PRVC. We're gonna go through vent modes. His FiO2 is 100%, his PEEP is 18, which is about as high as we generally use. Um, you can go up higher than that, but we don't use much higher than 18. Respiratory rate is set at 18, and his ABG there is not great, but compatible with life. PO2 of 70 is perfectly compatible with life, but pH above 7.2 is compatible with life. So we have a little bit of time at least to think about what we wanna do. Um, so this guy has ARDS. Now, I'll show you with some slides later. These, these the COVID patients tend to not be your, our classic um, pictures of ARDS when we put them on the ventilator. But in general, it's a syndrome. It's bilateral infiltrates, um, severe hypoxemia. If you look at your Berlin criteria, you can classify it into mild, moderate, and severe. It doesn't really matter, um, and it can't be explained by heart failure. Um, it's we see ARDS with lots of different conditions. And, inflammatory conditions, trauma, sepsis, all sorts of um, illnesses, either direct or indirect insult. This seems to be um, as a result of a direct insult from the virus to the lungs. The median time from, at least in COVID, with um, symptoms to ARDS is somewhere around eight days, seven to 10, but um, most specifically um, eight days. And the, the reason I say that these patients are different is they seem to be very hypoxic but their lungs are not stiff. So in our typical patient, if we wanna keep our pressures on the ventilator under 30, our typical ARDS patients have vol tidal volumes of 300, 350, maybe 400. These patients can have tidal volumes up to 700, 800, 900 cc's and still have pressures under um, what we consider safe. So their lungs are not stiff and it seems to sort of be one of the hallmarks of this disease. So. When you look at ARDS and the interventions that we can perform that will either, we have a couple that we know improve either mortality or patient outcomes. Um, and we're gonna go through these. The only one that I'm not gonna talk about in detail is conservative fluid management, because I think that sort of um, speaks 
to itself. It's, it's, these aren't patients that we're going to continue to bolus with leaders of crystalloid um, when they develop a little bit of AKI or when their blood pressure goes down. Um, wet lungs do not do well. So um, we try to be even more conservative with our fluids than typical patients. Um, and then we will go through, I believe, most of the things down here. So the only thing we're not going to talk about um, is pharmacotherapy. So we do use inhaled epoprostenol or Flolan in our typical ARDS patients. We're not using it in our COVID conditions. Number one, it doesn't work all that well. You don't get that much bang for your buck. Number two, um, the respiratory therapist has to break the circuit more than once a day in order to do that, and that exposes um, the people in the room. So uh, not much, not much help. This is um, what the lungs look like. So it's a very heterogeneous process. Um, and the reason that we talk about trying to keep our pressures low is that as you put more and more tidal volume into the lung, you're not really doing anything for these areas that are already collapsed like this, but what you are doing is over distending the areas of the lung that function fairly well. Um, and that's sort of depicted here. So you put the amount of tidal volume in here, this is collapsed and you can't do anything with it anyways. It's not participating in gas exchange. Here's some normal lung that you probably inflate to the degree you want. And then here's some very healthy lung that you're severely over inflating and um, ventilators can cause a lot of trauma, either by pressure, by too much volume. Um, and that's the whole purpose of the ARGNET low tidal volume ventilation strategies. So when we try to ventilate these patients and oxygenate them, we typically start somewhere around six cc's per kg of ideal body weight. Um, so even though the guy is 140 kilos, his lungs are not um, any bigger than yours or I, mine are. So we start around six cc's and can go down as low as four or three if needed. Um, it's not real important to know how to calculate a plateau pressure. There are plenty of folks in the ICU, respiratory therapists, APPs, et cetera, that can show you how to do that. Um, but the number that we generally shoot for is less than 30. Obviously, we adjust our respiratory rate as needed. We're going to go into specific um, modes of ventilation in just a minute. And then permissive hypercapnia. So these patients don't have a pH of 7.4. We just can't achieve that with low tidal volumes. They, as long as our pH is above 7.24, 7.25, we're perfectly happy. Um, it's a perfectly acceptable pH for all of your drugs to work and for the patient to, to continue to survive. Um, in the ARCNET trial, they used a volume control mode. It doesn't matter what mode of ventilation you use for these patients, as long as you're protecting the lungs. They also, this is a nice kind of table um, if you're stuck in the ICU and looking to get a little bit of help with where you should be going with your PEEP and your FiO2. Um, this is often, this is used by many hospitals as their sort of blanket way of respiratory therapy managing the ventilator. GW for so many reasons is different, but um, one of the things that's very different here is that we as the physicians manipulate the ventilators constantly. I'm sure respiratory hates us for it because every, many other hospitals where they work, they are the ones that control the ventilators and the docs are actually not supposed to touch them. Um, and they use tables like this because it, it keeps things um, sort of standardized and controlled. But, um, you know, it's, it's just pointing out the fact that you shouldn't be on 100% and five of peak, right? You know, that doesn't make sense. We try to get our FiO2 down to 60% because above that you get um, issues with oxygen toxicity. Um, and the PEEP, again, we, we try to aim for less than, than 18. As far as ventilator management goes, the two modes that you guys would really be dealing with um, are going to be either volume control or pressure control. I'm not going to go through the difference between strict volume control and PRVC because we don't use strict volume control here. We use PRVC, which is called pressure regulated volume control. And the reason that we use that is that it's sort of like having a little mini respiratory, respiratory therapist in the ventilator. So strict volume control just shoves the, the set tidal volume in at whatever pressure um, it takes. PRVC, um, and I have a slide on this in just a, a few minutes, is um, we'll put the volume in at a certain pressure, or we'll give you a certain pressure that it thinks it takes to get the volume in. So it'll give you 28, you know, centimeters of pressure, and if I set the tidal volume for 500, it'll put the 28 centimeters of pressure in, and it'll get 580. And so then it'll say, huh, it doesn't need that much pressure. So then it'll take the pressure down on the next breath to 24, 26, and it'll figure out how to get that tidal volume in at the lowest possible pressure. Um, so it's just a smarter, smarter mode. So you set the tidal volume, the respiratory rate, um, and in every, in all of our 
conventional modes, you set the rate, the PEEP and the FiO2. In here, you set the tidal volume. So every breath, the patient, whether the patient triggers it or whether the machine triggers it, the patient will get that much volume, that much tidal volume. So what you need to pay attention to is what your peak and plateau pressures are. So if you set a tidal volume of 400 and their pressures are 40, the patient can't tolerate 400 cc's of tidal volume and we've got to start to come down. Um, so that's the important thing to watch when you're in a volume control mode. Um, in this mode, if your patient, you know, most of these patients are going to be hypercapnic, um, and if you need to help them blow off some more CO2, you're going to either increase your tidal volume or you're going to increase your respiratory rate. Some fun questions to go through in just a little bit. For all the modes, or both of these modes, if you want to increase your oxygenation, you're going to increase your PEEP or increase your FiO2. Pressure control um, just differs in that you don't set the tidal volume, you set the pressure. So we set a pressure of, say, it's nice because you can limit, you never have to go above that 30 if that's what you're trying to do. So I can set a pressure of 20 over a peep of 10, right? And then so 10 plus 20 is 30, and I know that I'm sort of at that level and I'm not going to cause ventilator-induced lung injury. The problem is it depends on how stiff the patient's lungs are. Um, some patients, you know, you guys would have, with 20 over 10, are going to have tidal volumes of 1,500, 2,000 um, ml. Your patient with ARDS, 20 over 10, may only get them 250 to 300 cc. So you just sort of have to watch the tidal volume. And as the patient gets better, with that same amount of pressure, the, you'll see the tidal volumes go up. Um, and on the contrary, if they're getting worse, those tidal volumes will be, will be less. Um, if you want to improve your minute ventilation or blow off more CO2 with this mode, again, you can always adjust the respiratory rate or you can um, increase the pressure above your peak. So you could go from 20 over 10 to 25 over 10. You know, it violates our pressure. Um, APRV, I will show you, but you won't be managing APRV. That will be done by an intensivist um, or one of our APPs um, to assist you because it's just above where we would expect um, folks who don't do it. So this is what PRVC looks like. You can see here, this is your pressure. So it puts the pressure in and then realizes, okay, I can come down a little bit and still achieve that volume. And every time that you change something, you'll see it start to do this again for a few breaths to try to figure out how do I get this tidal volume in with the lowest amount of pressure. Um, this up here on the screen is sort of where we select our mode. Um, if you were to click on that, you would have a screen open that gave you the option of picking your tidal volume, your rate, your PEEP, and your FiO2. Down here is where we find minute ventilation and our tidal volume. So it's set to 400. You can see we're achieving 400. Um, this is the set respiratory rate. I'm not sure how the person's breathing slower than the respiratory rate, but um, clearly they must have just gone up from 15 to 20, and this is catching up. And then this is your peak pressure, which is good enough estimate um, in most patients as to what the, the plateau pressure is. So that's where we'll be looking there. So um, we're on PRVC. We have um, a ABG that looks like this, and these are our settings. So we're getting patient size and CCs per kg and all of that. If we wanted to make this ABG look better, what kind of changes might we make? Okay, Chant said you could increase the respiratory rate, that's right, or increase the tidal volume. Very good. What if we wanted to make this PAO2 look a little better? Good, okay, easy peasy. Um, this is what pressure control looks like. The pressure is always constant here because you're setting the pressure, so it doesn't show up very well down here, but this person's on 100%. They're on a pressure control of 20, so this is pressure control above PEEP here. So 20 over a PEEP of 5, which equals your 25 that you see up there, okay? And then the rate is set to 15. This person's achieving a tidal volume of around 400, um, and also the rate set at 15, the person's breathing at 15. The way that you know if the patient is breathing above the ventilator, what we call breathing above the ventilator, meaning above the set rate, obviously this number will be higher. Um, and the other way to know is that on our ventilators, anything that where the flow starts with a little purple line here, that means that the patient's taking that breath on their own. So same ABG, but with these settings, 
um, how do we improve the PCU queue for this person? Sorry, I realize I changed the settings that, from the picture, but the, they're set to 15 over 8. How might we improve their ABG? Okay. What else could we do for the PCO2? Good. So you can go up on your, your pressure here from 15 to 18 to 20. Um, we have a little bit of room because our peak here is only 23, right? So we have some room. Okay. Oh my God. So this is, I'm just going to show you because it's a mode that we use fairly frequently in these patients. So APRV or Bivent, depending on which um, brand of ventilator you're using, is basically a bi-level, sort of almost like a, a CPAP with a very quick release in order to help you get rid of CO2. So you take the person up to a certain pressure here, it's 28 or 29, and you keep them up there for about anywhere between three and a half and six seconds. Um, the purpose of this is that you're trying to keep the alveoli Descended to a reasonable amount to because that's when all of your gas exchange is happening, right? That's when um, they're actually getting the oxygen. So you keep people up as long as, as they will tolerate from an ABG standpoint, from a CO2 standpoint, and then you have a very quick release here that allows a big exhale of CO2, and then they go right back up. The reason I'm going to say, I'm sorry. So these are this is how things are set. So you have a, a P high, so that's that top pressure that you're going to. Our P low or our PEEP is always zero. And it doesn't mean that we let the lungs collapse all the way, but this exhale is so short that that flow never goes all the way back to zero. Okay, the flow, um, it's there to, to, again, allow a quick release of CO2, but it's not fast enough for everything to completely collapse. Um, we're basically relying on a little bit of stacking or auto PEEP um, if you will. So this is your flow curve here. We like it to come up to maybe 50%, 75 to 50% back to baseline. Um, and that usually is enough to, to get a release of CO2. We set the amount of time that they're up on that high pressure, the amount of time for the release. Um, and generally it looks something like this. As you can tell, the minute ventilation with something like this is a lot lower. Okay, so patients that are very hypercapnic do not tolerate this. We just can't ventilate them enough with it. Um, but for patients like our, our COVID patients where hypoxia tends to be their, their biggest issue, it is a very nice um, and very efficient mode to use, or effective, I should say. Um, this is a typical ARDS patient, so P high of 28 and a tidal volume of 230 to 300 or so, um, which is pretty dismal uh, and very stiff lungs. This is a patient we have upstairs who's on a P high of 35, right now, or 32, excuse me. Uh, his tidal volumes are a liter. Um, and when you bring it down, he gets very, very hypoxic. Um, he's on 80, though. I think we just bumped him to 100%. Um, on this particular ventilator, we can't get down to zero with the people at one. But um, his T high is three and a half seconds. His T low is almost one second. But um, much different kind of tidal volume on this person. Um, again, the T, like I said, the P high, we usually set somewhere between 20 and 30. The P low is always a zero. There's your times that you spend at the higher pressure and the lower pressure. Um, maneuvers that we use to correct um, oxygenation. So if we're set on APRV and our patient is still with poor um, saturation, we will increase P high or increase the amount of time that they're spending at that P high, so the T high. Um, if they're not ventilating well, you can again increase that P high or you can decrease the time that they're at the T high. If you can see, oh, I didn't put it in here, did I? Where's the setting? Sorry, guys. Oh, so this will tell you here. So as you set your, your inspiratory time, it basically sets a respiratory rate for you, right? Because you're inspiring for 4.7, expiring for 0.3. So that's a five second breath. So 60 divided by five is 12 breaths per minute, right? So it'll tell you here. If you want to improve their ventilation, you come down to three and a half or so um, on your T high and you'll go up to 15 breaths a minute. Does that make sense? Kind of. 
again, you guys won't have to do anything with it. So going a little further, um, our guy again gets here. These are what his stats look like. We put him on APRV and he gets very, very uncomfortable and starts fighting the ventilator. Um, you decide he needs to be more sedated. So now we're gonna have to figure out what drugs do we use. So sedation on the ventilator, one of the things that we're very big on is making sure that we always include analgesia, um, mostly to try to cut down on the actual sedative that we use. So most of them will get around the clock Tylenol, um, many of them around the clock oxycodone. The dilated AACA is a really great thing for your patients that are not on airborne and contact precautions because the nurse can go in the room and push the button for them, but not as great to rely on um, right now when the nurses are um, trying to not be in the room as much as possible. Uh, and then we use PRN Dilaudid as well. Um, propofol is generally our first choice if they are hemodynamically stable. I have to say, for some reason, I heard from other people across the country say the same thing, that these patients, for whatever reason it is, are very difficult to sedate. They're on three infusions, which is not typical for us, even in our paralyzed patients. Um, so we're having to use a lot, of, a lot of drugs. But propofol, as long as they're hemodynamically stable, which most of these folks have been, um, is our, our first choice. It goes on easily. It comes off easily. Um, we do look at their triglyceride levels, especially now because people are on very high doses. Um, so we generally will go up to 50 mics per kg per minute, and um, once we start approaching that, we we add other medications. Um, you are there is risk for propofol infusion syndrome if they're on very very high doses for um, a long period of time. Again, over 70 for more than 48 hours, but we don't use doses that are that high. And then the one thing to know is it is a negative inotrope. So if it's somebody with a poor objection fraction, it's not a great drug to use, um, but for most of our patients, it is first line. Um, Presidex or dexmedetomidine, it is very great for withdrawal syndromes, agitation, et cetera. There is no respiratory depression with it, so we can extubate our patients with, these, with this on as an infusion. You do see bradycardia, which for many of our patients is actually helpful because most of them start out tachycardic. We don't see much hypotension with it. Um, it can be a lot of volume at high doses. So in your patients that are very volume overloaded, not doing well, um, it can be a little bit of an issue, but it's a great drug. We use it a lot. We are lucky it's not um, withheld from us. So we that it is in a lot of places, it is not. Um, so again, that's usually the second, second drug that we will often add. Ketamine we use a lot too. I don't mean to say that ketamine has absolutely no hemodynamic issues, obviously. Um, it does, it can cause some tachycardia, it can cause some hypertension, but it's another great drug. It gets you pain relief, it gives you amnesia. It does not cause hypotension like many of our other sedatives do. So um, we, if the patient's hypotensive, very hypotensive to begin with, we will often start with ketamine. Um, but those, those three drips are, are usually the three the infusions that we use. We do not use um, benzo infusions. We don't use Versed infusions, things like that. We will use PRN um, if we really need to. Um, and we don't use fentanyl drips either. It's just they, they hang out in the, the fat stores for a long period of time and then patients don't wake up. So for patients that are on this amount of sedation for long periods of time or who just seem to have issues with appropriate agitation, frustration, anxiety when they're on the ventilator, we use a fair amount of clonopin, usually starting somewhere around a half to one milligram TID. Um, we use Seroquel oftentimes at night um, and BID in patients who are very, very agitated. We use IV Haldol if we can um, in higher doses than I know we're used to using on the floor. So we generally will start with five IV Q6 um, or five IV Q6 PRN. We have to keep a close eye on the QTC. Obviously, a lot of these patients are on um, Azithro and Aquinol and et cetera, and, and other medications that can affect the QTC. So we have to keep a, a close eye on that. And then if they need something procedural for sedation, so if they're on their baseline propofol or whatever, and you're going to put a central line in them, we'll give them a little bit of Versed and a little bit of fentanyl. Um, we use those for procedures because they're short, tend to be fairly short acting. So back to our guy, he gets a little bit better with APRV. His stats come up to maybe 94%, but he is um, still requiring 100% FiO2 on the ventilator. So 
the next step in our algorithm is generally to try to, um, to paralyze them. So what you can do, you can give a one-time dose of a paralytic, whether it's vecuronium, rocuronium, whatever you want. Um, rocuronium seems to be the most popular drug in our ICU. Um, and see if that gets you anywhere. Does it help? Even in your patients that are very, very well sedated, just the chest wall, abdominal wall, any use of that can actually cause um, a little bit of hypoxia. So we'll often get a little bit um, more of a cushion with neuromuscular blockade. So you can give that rocuronium and see if they get better, um, if that oxygenation improves. And if it does, then we generally start an infusion um, and we use um, cisatricurium, okay? Um, it's also called Nimbex. It's a whole nurse-driven protocol. They put on um, a BIS monitor, which is a bispectral index that monitors um, basically like a mini frontal EEG. Um, they use it in the operating room as well. So it gives you a, a number to tell you how asleep the person is. And generally we aim for 40, between 40 and 60 is considered to be general anesthesia. So the nurses will titrate their, um, their sedative to achieve a, a number, a bit somewhere between 40 and 60 so that we know the patient is adequately sedated underneath that paralytic, right? We don't want anybody awake and paralyzed. Um, they also have twitch monitors that they, they use to tell you how paralyzed the patient is, whether they're paralyzed or not. So it's a whole nurse-driven protocol that all we have to do is tell them to start the NIMBEX. So now we get to the point where we've paralyzed the person, we've optimized our ventilator, we've done lung protective ventilation strategy, we're not bolusing them with liters of fluid, and we're still having problems um, with hypoxia and hypercapnia. And now sort of comes the decision of who do we prone and who do we put on ECMO. Not the easiest decision um, that, to make you feel more comfortable maybe, or maybe not, depending on who you are. The decision goes through the intensivists, the cardiac surgeons are not involved in this decision. They are obviously involved if we call them and say we want them to consult and, you know, they have the right to say no. But um, they, are not in, they are not the first person that's called from an outside hospital. Um, they're not called until we've seen and evaluated the patient. So this is what it looks like to prone somebody. Obviously, it takes a lot of manpower. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. There are a lot of risks to it. Um, you know, on our typical world, we have this lovely bed called the rotoprone. You can put someone in it and the thing rotates back and forth so that they don't get pressure sores. It will flip them back over for you so that you don't need a team of six, eight people in the room, just flip them back and forth in the day. But obviously we don't have that option right now. So we have to, we have to be able to flip somebody like this. Um, the whole reason of proning somebody is that, um, part of the reason is that when you are supine, just the weight of the heart and the mediastinum alone can cause um, compression in the, um, in the dorsal aspects of the lung. So when you flip somebody over, you actually, especially with these folks, see a pretty impressive improvement in their oxygenation status. The, the process of cloning people is not obviously without risk, especially now um, you have to be very, very careful with the endotracheal tube, especially in these patients. We don't want it to come to get obstructed. You also don't want it to disconnect from the ventilator and spew coronavirus all over you. Um, and it takes a lot of people to go in the room, especially when um, you know it's a larger person. So in order to get somebody flipped over, it can take a lot of people. Um, they should be prone for at least 16 hours a day, even up to 18 or 20 hours, and then you'll flip them back over for four or five hours and see how they do. If they do well, you can leave them supine. If they don't do well, you can re-prone them again after a few hours. As a sort of protocol here of um, how we do things, you know, going from low flow to high flow nasal cannula to mechanical ventilation to prone, um, we're trying to prone most of these patients. We're trying to not do much ECMO, especially as resources will be limited. How to choose one versus the other. So proning should be our go-to maneuver. It's not as great for um, in the face BV ECMO can be very helpful. Size does matter. So it is difficult to cannulate somebody who's large, but it is very, very difficult to prone someone who's 140 kilograms. You're exposing a lot of staff 
in that room twice a day just to prone a person. As far as ECMO goes, that's also a resource issue. Right now, for our ECMO patients, there's two, two nurses to one patient. Um, it's probably easier if there are two patients rather than just one, um, but obviously the one the one nurse can't sit in the room all day long. They basically rotate in two hour shifts. Um, but these patients get Q2 to, I well, always started to space it out now, but the protocol is Q2 hour blood gases. Um, our nurses are ECMO specialists, so they act as the perfusionist as well. So they're not just the bedside nurse for the very sick patient. They're also um, manning and manipulating the ECMO machine is important. So if someone's been on a ventilator for more than seven days, um, they, the results with ECMO are pretty poor. The results with ECMO are, are poor no matter what in this situation, um, in the coronavirus situation. But certainly if they've been on the vent already for a week, they're a pretty, pretty poor candidate. If they've got organ dysfunction already, especially any type of liver dysfunction, our surgeons usually say no. So for our gentleman, hospital day seven, um, he had been kind of cruising along, actually looking a little bit better, and then hospital day seven, his creatinine went from 1.7 to 2.7, his ferritin doubled, he started to become hypotensive. And so now we have to decide, do we bolus this guy with fluids? Is he gonna be fluid responsive or do we start vasopressors? And if so, which one do we use? So for him, I was not on service at this time. We may have tried a little bit of fluid. You could try some you know, albumin or you can try a liter of fluid and see if you get any kind of response. Um, but wanted to talk just for a minute about vasopressors. These are basically the three that you need to know for the ICU. Um, Levofed or norepinephrine is our first line. Again, unlike most places, we dose it differently. So most places dose it based on weight, which makes a lot more sense because for a very tiny person, um, 30 micrograms per minute of Levofed is a lot. For a very large person, it is not a lot, but we generally use um, Levofed dosed in mics per minute and um, up to 30 to 40 is sort of um, our max with a few exceptions. When we get to a dose of 10, of Levofed, we add vasopressin. Um, it goes on at 0.04. We will go up to 0.08 when the Levofed is up as high as 30, but no, nobody should ever be on anything higher than 0.08. Um, and epinephrine is generally third line, especially in these patients. Again, starts anywhere between one and two and can go up to a maximum of 10 to 15. We do not need central lines for our vasopressors. We have actually just done a study that has proven that it's safe to put them through a midline. Um, it's not a prospective randomized, but we had about 250 patients that had um, no extravasation, no complications um, from the pressors infusing through them. I think out of 250, we had three line related infections, but um, we use, we have a whole protocol now that we put vasopressors through our midlines. If they only have a peripheral IV, you can use phenylephrine until the midline gets in, but otherwise, the three pressors that you saw on the previous page are what you need. Um, angiotensin II or Giapresa is out there. We do use it, but it's not something that you guys are going to have to deal with. Generally, that should go through an intensivist um, to make that decision. So again, he goes on leave a fed of 30 and vaso of 0.08 and epi up to 10. His lactate starts to rise from four to six to 13. Mind you, for the previous six and a half days, his lactate had been 1.8. He starts on a bicarb infusion because his bicarb is in the single digits. He starts on CDVH because he's not peeing anymore. And then hospital day eight, his EKG goes from normal to this. And then by hospital day eight into nine, he passes away. This gentleman went on VA ECMO. He did not go on VV. Um, he was our first case and the decision was made between the intensivist and the surgeon at the time that we hear about these patients that start to improve from their ARDS and then they die of cardiovascular death, basically. Uh, uh, their EF goes from normal down to less than 10% and they get multi-organ system failure and die. So he went on VA for that purpose, thinking that we would be able to defend his cardiac failure with VA ECMO if that were the case. And um, the VA, the A part of the VA ECMO didn't do anything for him. So this next person that we put on, we put on VV. Yeah, there was absolutely nothing that anybody could do. This was sort of the model of the slide that Dr. Davison used when she talked um, to the anesthesia folks about similar stuff that we're talking about here today. So it's not that we're gonna throw a hospitalist into each of these floors and they see you and hang out at home. Um, 
the more likely strategy would be, you know, some non ICU folks manning the floors with one intensivist per two floors or at worst one intensivist per, per four floors. Um, hopefully to make you feel a little bit better. We have a very good backup system right now. We're not all on service all the time. I'm actually not on service this week or next. So I'm at home for backup. I worked over the weekend for just so that Danielle would take two days off. Um, so we have our own sort of system of backup. We have the trauma critical care folks who also always have somebody um, at home and, and as a backup system. For us right now, we have our pulmonary critical care colleagues who um, are also several of them available to help us should we need critical care folks. So we won't throw you in without it um, unless you want to jump in. <laughs> By all means, if you want to jump in, come on in. Um, you guys are busy enough as it is, um, pro probably busier than we are. Um, so we appreciate being able to work together. Um, I hope it doesn't come to that. I hope I don't have to see folks in the ICU, um, but we will welcome you and help you as much as we can. Yeah, the nurses are the ones that are going to be the, uh, they're the ones that, I don't want to say rate limiting step. I don't know the right words that I want to choose, but on a good day, we don't have enough nurses to staff our, our ICU, as I'm sure the floors don't, nowhere in the hospital does. So. That is a problem. We will have to extend nursing ratios and go to, you know, a senior nurse overseeing three or four assignments. It may get to that point. Um, I don't, they don't have a backup system. They have hired, they are hiring other um, travelers. They are hiring other agents. They have hired agency nurses to have as backup. Um, I don't know what RT is doing. I know the nursing management has been approved and was trying to hire agency folks to, to be a level of backup. Other questions? Okay. Um, and for the couple people in the room that I don't know, I'm Katrina. I was a resident here, chief here, fellow here, even a med student here. So that's why I didn't introduce myself. I figured I'm going to know. Anything else? Thank you guys for listening.